Have you ever wondered who oversees aviation safety and coordinates search and rescue operations worldwide? Enter the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO. This specialized agency of the United Nations is responsible for establishing international standards and regulations to ensure the safety, efficiency, and regularity of air transport. One key part of ICAO's work is embodied in Annex 12, a document dedicated to search and rescue operations. It lays down the framework for providing rapid and efficient search and rescue services in the event of an aircraft emergency anywhere in the world. These operations are crucial in safeguarding lives when every second counts. So Annex 12 is a vital document that ensures the safety of air travel. Why is search and rescue so critical for aviation safety? In the vast expanse of the sky, a plane in distress is a proverbial needle in a haystack, but not when search and rescue operations, or SAR, are in play. These operations are the lifeblood of aviation safety. They're the safety net that pilots, crew, and passengers trust implicitly. Picture this. It's 1972, and Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 has crashed in the Andes. For over two months, survivors braved harsh conditions. It was only through SAR operations that 16 survivors were finally located and rescued, a stark reminder of the lives SR can save. Or consider the 2009 Air France Flight 447 crash. The SR operation took two years to locate the wreckage and retrieve the flight recorders. It was a painstaking process, but invaluable for understanding what went wrong and how to prevent similar incidents in the future. These examples underscore the role SR plays in both saving lives and furthering aviation safety. It's not just about the immediate response, but also the long-term impact of lessons learned from each incident. As we can see, SAR operations are crucial to aviation safety. So what exactly does Annex 12 entail? Well, at its core, Annex 12 is all about the establishment and operation of search and rescue SR services. It sets the stage for how these crucial operations should be carried out. The key provisions state that each contracting state should, either individually or in cooperation with other states, arrange for the provision of SR services within its territory. This includes the establishment of necessary search and rescue regions based on geographical and operational considerations. Annex 12 also highlights the need for states to have a well-coordinated system for the prompt and efficient operation of SR services. This means having a clear plan for how to handle distress situations right from the time they are reported to the final rescue and evacuation. Another pivotal provision is the requirement for states to keep their SR services well-equipped and ready to respond at a moment's notice. This includes the availability of suitable aircraft, vessels and other necessary resources. Moreover, Annex 12 underscores the importance of regular training and exercises for SR personnel to ensure they're always ready to respond to emergencies. In a nutshell, these provisions ensure that SR operations can be carried out effectively and lives can be saved when every second counts. How are SAR services organized around the world, you may wonder? Well, it's quite an intricate setup. Search and rescue services are distributed around the globe, with each nation having its own designated search and rescue region, or SRR. These SRRs are defined by geographical boundaries and are the responsibility of a particular nation. In essence, every square inch of our Earth is covered by a specific SAR region. This ensures that no matter where an incident occurs, there is always a designated SR service ready to respond. These regions are not just randomly assigned, they are carefully planned based on factors such as flight routes, population density, and the capabilities of each nation's SR services. The aim is to ensure that help can arrive as quickly as possible, no matter where a distress situation might occur. Furthermore, SR services within these regions work together, sharing critical information and resources when needed. This global network of SAR services is vital in ensuring a seamless and effective response to aviation emergencies. This organization ensures efficient response times and coordinated efforts. How do countries cooperate in SAR operations? It's a question that might seem complex, but the answer lies in the principles of international solidarity and shared responsibility. In the vast and often unpredictable world of aviation, 
Ensuring safety is a collective effort that transcends borders. When an aircraft is in distress, it doesn't matter where it took off from or where it was heading. What matters is that it's in need of assistance, and that's where international cooperation comes in. States work together hand in hand to ensure that search and rescue operations are carried out swiftly and effectively. This cooperation extends further than you might think. It's not just about responding to emergencies as they occur. Rather, it involves meticulous planning, coordination, and preparation. States must agree on protocols, share resources, and train together to ensure that when the time comes, they're ready to act as one. In essence, search and rescue is a testament to our global commitment to preserving life. It's a shining example of what can be achieved when we put aside our differences and work together for a common cause. As we navigate the skies, we can take comfort in knowing that wherever we are in the world, help is never far away. Cooperation between states is key to successful SAR operations. What preparatory measures must states take for SAR? Well, the first step in preparation for search and rescue or SAR operations is to establish and maintain a comprehensive training program. This program should cover all aspects of SAR operations, from the initial notification of an incident to the final recovery of survivors. Training should be regular and rigorous, with a focus on real-world scenarios to ensure that all personnel are prepared for the challenges they may encounter. Beyond training, states should also conduct regular exercises to test the effectiveness of their SAR services. These exercises allow for the identification of potential weaknesses and the opportunity to refine procedures before a real incident occurs. Moreover, these preparatory measures are not a one-time deal. They should be ongoing, with continuous improvement as the ultimate goal. This includes updating training programs and exercises to reflect changes in technology, equipment, and best practices in the field of search and rescue. It's important to remember that the effectiveness of SAR operations is only as good as the preparation that goes into them. These measures are critical for the readiness of SR operations. How has technology improved SR operations? As we delve into the world of search and rescue or SAR, it's clear that technology has become an invaluable ally. From the early days of manual and visual searching, we've ventured into an era where technology drives the success of SR missions. Innovations like satellite communication and global positioning systems, or GPS, have revolutionized the way SR operations are conducted. These technologies have enabled precise location tracking, making the search process more efficient and less time-consuming. In fact, in many cases, these advancements have turned what could have been long drawn-out operations into swift rescues. Let's not forget about thermal imaging and night vision technology. These tools have made it possible to conduct SAR operations even in the dark or in poorly visible conditions, significantly expanding the operational capabilities of SR teams. And then there's drone technology. Unmanned aircraft are now used to survey large areas quickly, sending back real-time images and data that aid in the search process. All these technological advancements have not only improved the effectiveness of SR operations, but they've also greatly increased the chances of success in finding and rescuing individuals. Technology plays a role in enhancing the efficiency of SR operations, our operations. And as technology continues to evolve, the future of SR looks promising. What are the emergency phases defined by ICO, you may wonder? Well, the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICO, defines three key emergency phases, uncertainty, alert, and distress. The uncertainty phase, or phase in SERFA, kicks in when there is concern about the safety of an aircraft or its occupants. This could be due to lack of communication or deviation from the flight plan, for example. Following this is the alert phase, or phase alerta. This phase begins when communication has been lost for an extended period, or the aircraft is not operating as expected, causing apprehension about the safety of those on board. Lastly, the distress phase, or phase de tresva, is declared when there is a reasonable certainty that the aircraft and its occupants are threatened by grave and imminent danger. This could be due to a crash, forced landing, or the aircraft being unable to communicate. These phases are not mere labels, but critical stages that dictate the level of response and resources dispatched 
for search and rescue operations. Understanding these phases is crucial for effective response during emergencies. What are some misconceptions about SAR? Let's dive into that. A common myth is that search and rescue operations are spontaneous. In reality, they're the result of meticulous planning and cooperation between states, as laid out in ICO's Annex 12. Another frequent misconception is that SAR services operate independently. Again, not true. These services are globally coordinated with clearly defined regions to ensure fast and efficient responses. People often ask, is technology replacing human roles in SR? While technology plays a crucial role, it enhances human capabilities rather than replacing them. After all, the success of SR operations hinges on the skills, training, and decision-making abilities of the human team. Lastly, there's a widespread belief that SAR is exclusively for aviation incidents. While aviation is a significant part, SAR's scope extends to maritime and land-based incidents as well. It's important to understand the facts about SAR operations. What does the future hold for SR and Annex 12? As we move forward, the world of search and rescue, or SR and Annex 12, will continue to evolve and adapt. The need for updates is critical in an ever-changing technological landscape. Consider this, aviation technology is not standing still. New aircraft types and flight systems are being introduced at an accelerated pace. Unmanned aircraft systems, commonly known as drones, are becoming more prevalent and sophisticated. With these advancements, the demands on SR operations are also changing. It's clear that Annex 12 must keep pace with these developments. It needs to remain flexible, adaptable, and future-proof to continue to guide and regulate SR operations effectively. This evolution isn't just about technology, it's also about new strategies and methodologies, improved training, and enhanced international cooperation. All these will shape the future of SR and Annex 12. So what's the takeaway? The future of SR and Annex 12 is a future of continuous adaptation and improvement. As technology advances, so too will SAR operations and the regulations that govern them.